So, with no further ado, I'm very excited to ask Lou Friedland and the panelists for the first conference, uh, for the first session to uh, come up and begin. Hello, my name is Lou Friedland. I'm a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Are we double mic'd here? Okay, let me take this off. Here. Professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I would join Stephen in welcoming you here. Today, we have a quite a remarkable panel to start the day, and I don't want to waste much time uh, in, getting to the, in to getting to the conversation itself. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, if I gave you their full bios, we could spend the next uh, half hour at least. Uh, so I'm going to give you the shortened version, and I, re I refer you to the longer bio sheet to learn more and on the website. Uh, and then we're going to get straight to three questions that are going to be our starting point for today. And uh, then we're going to open it to the, the, the World Wide Web, the blogging community, and the, our questioners. And then we will open it to everyone else. The questions that we're charged with uh, addressing today are uh, essentially, uh, can journalism afford ethics? It's, a, it's an important question. Can journalism afford journalism is another question. What are the pathways to the future? And are there new models for doing good public interest journalism and maintaining ethical standards? So we will get to those. But first, I want to uh, introduce our panelists, uh, starting at the, at the far end, Phil Rosenthal, who is the Chicago Tribune's media columnist, has been a working journalist since he was 17 when he talked his way somehow into the Waukegan News Sun. Still in high school, he earned his journalism degree here at the UW-Madison. We're very proud of him and he sits on our board of visitors. He's covered sports, spot news, and media for the Cap Times, and I see Phil here. Uh, uh, we have, I'm sure we have some other Cap Times folks here as well. He spent 11 years at the Los Angeles Daily News as a sports writer, TV critic, and ultimately a columnist whose work was distributed by the New York Times News Service. He went home to Chicago in 96, where he joined the Sun Times, uh, and today uh, he moved to the Chicago Trib, I should say, in 2005. Phil, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Next uh, to Phil is Kathy Beeson. Uh, uh, Kathy is the director of production at uh, Wisconsin Public Television, responsible for creating, the, uh, creating and delivering a wide range of broadcast and web projects for the statewide network. Uh, Wisconsin Public Television, as some of you, many of you Wisconsinites know, is one of the best uh, public television systems in the country, particularly for news and public affairs. Under Kathy's leadership, uh, the WPT has won four consecutive national USC Annenberg Walter Cronkite awards for ex uh, excellence in political journalism. And before becoming director of production, uh, Kathy was uh, executive producer of News and Public Affairs uh, at WPT and came to WPT in 1989. So after working as a commercial news reporter, so she has been on both sides, the commercial and the public. Kathy, welcome. Uh, John Sawyer is uh, founding director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, which is a nonprofit organization that funds independent reporting with the intent of raising the standard of media coverage of global affairs. The center funds over 30 reporting projects each year, so John will have a lot to say about new models, I'm sure. In collaboration with nearly every major media outlet, uh, it supplies uh, its principal supplier of video uh, documentary for the public television program Foreign Exchange. Uh, John's got a, a, a remarkably uh, distinguished bio here, and I'm going to uh, just hit a few highlights. He was the center's director after 31, became the center's director after a 31-year career with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, where he served as Washington Bureau Chief uh, from 93 through 2005 and has seen major stories all around the world from apartheid to the uh, uh, fall of communism in Eastern Europe and more recently Sudan's civil war. He's won the National Press Club Award for Foreign Correspondence three times in a row, so we have a lot of hat tricks here on the 
uh, on the panel today, and he's a graduate of Yale University and has held fellowships at Harvard and Princeton universities, which we call those other universities. <laughs> Coming back to UW, Ellen Foley, uh, after more than known, best known to most, that many of you in the room is the uh, editor of the Wisconsin State Journal, but uh, she left uh, recently after more than 30 years in the news business to join the higher education field uh, last year as director of development at uh, MATC Madison Area Technical College here in Madison. She's worked as a reporter and editor at several news organizations, including the Philadelphia Daily News, where she was editor of the Kansas City Star and Minneapolis Star Trib, all great papers, as many of you know. Uh, Ellen and the newsrooms that she's led have been recognized for top flight journalism, including a Pulitzer Prize finalist honor for editing, editorial uh, writing rather, in uh, 2007. As I said, uh, she's uh, at MATC now, recently founded or co-founded the proposed Institute for New Media and Professional Writing, and is now writing a book on her family's experience with cancer, a double alumna of UW-Madison with a master's in journalism and mass communication as well. So thank you all, and now let's get to the conversation. I'm going to, we're going to do a very quick round robin on the questions, and I would like us to talk with each other, uh, and with the goal of getting to you, uh, the audience, uh, the participants, I should say, as soon as we can. Uh, so let's start. Uh, the future of journalism is being debated amid the decline of traditional economic models and a media revolution. So our first question, and it's a simple but a hard one, is in tough times, can journalism afford ethics? Who would like to start? Uh, is there really any debate that there's no choice but to afford ethics? Because, I mean, what is journalism without ethics? It's, it's fiction, right? Uh, this, uh, That's a whole other business. Or opinion. Opinion. It's, it's, a, it's something else. I mean, I, I think if, if, if journalism is to continue it, yeah, there's no question. It has to have ethics. I mean, what, do you, what, are you, what are you providing the public otherwise? What are you providing your, uh, anybody? You know, what, what good can you do and what, what, what are you actually selling if you're not selling ethics? Does anybody want to take... Dispute, dispute. Yeah, we're not against ethics up here. Um, <laughs> I but, was going to take the concurring yeah, view, but yeah, I didn't think it would yeah. be seemly. I, I think the, the more um, relevant question is uh, how are the ethics, ethics going to morph? Um, much of the new journalism is online. Um, I'm working now at the community college, and we are doing um, lots of stuff that, that feels a lot like journalism. Uh, we're putting up web websites that, um, in our case, particularly evolve um, uh, seeking jobs. Uh, but we know we're not journalists, um, per se, out at the community mm -hmm. college. But we're, what I, when, I, when working with students, I'm, um, I'm constantly looking at how the ethics are, are shifting. The other thing that I'm seeing is that my colleagues in the, um, in the um, uh, print world, the print slash web world at, at news organizations are, are seeing a, um, their publishers getting a lot more involved in online products. And the, I think the question here is, well, what's a product and what is journalism? In my case, um, uh, Clark Hoyt is here, and I refer to him as my godfather. Were it not for him, I would probably be laid off by now. And um, working in the cafeteria at MATC rather than de the development office. And in my time, the ethics were passed down from people like Clark to me and others. And there was a conversation that was going on on that in the newsroom every day on everything that you did. And I'm not sure that's happening now. Yeah, I think the point about, uh, Ellen's point about new journalism and, and is really spot on because the, Ethics to me is, is crucial because we're in the process of inventing the new journalism right now. I mean, there's, there's a lot of focus on, on the death of the old journalism, old models that, that, that are uh -huh. collapsing before us. And that's a very traumatic, um, important um, story that all of us are following closely. But in the meantime, there, all sorts of new forms are coming up on, on the web and elsewhere and, and, and new forms of funding and so on. And the Pulitzer Center is one among many that's, that's, that's working in that area. And, it's been very instructive to me over this last three and a half years since we started at the Pulitzer Center to, to think through how that works because we, we in effect, we, we have a pretty good name to start with at the Pulitzer Center, 
but we, the, the product, the journalism that we do, we're creating a brand. We're trying to establish that this is an important source of, of original, strong reporting. And so each story that we do, each project that we take on, has been a matter of building a reputation for ethical journalism, so that, that the, so that the brand has has meaning and that it has it builds a following. And so it's, we've gone at three, three, three and a half years ago when we first started, we'd go to a, a newspaper or a broadcast outlet and say we have this project we'd like to do in in Mozambique or in Guatemala or wherever, and and the response that a lot of organizations will. Why should we do that with an outside organization? Who is that? How can we tell our readers? How do our readers know what they're getting if they're if 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 this newspaper is combining with the this new entity called the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting to do it? And and slowly over time, as we've done now, you know, we're just approaching our hundredth project in in sixty different countries. We we have developed, we think, a, a reputation for quality in this work and and high ethical standards and. Part of it is because of the partnerships themselves, that, that each project we take on has an old media outlet as well as new media platforms. We're very much into, you know, we put all of our video work onto, onto YouTube. We take our journalists out to colleges and high schools and talk about the work. We do a lot of aftermarketing on the web to try to build interest in the projects. But every one of our projects has got at least one and usually multiple old media partners so that you look at it and you say, well, that's a story on Agent Orange. It was sponsored by the Pulitzer Center, but it was in the New York Times and it was on foreign exchange. And so you look at it and say, well, that has meaning. That's been vetted by the New York Times or the Washington Post or NPR or whatever. And that's been very important in building the brand. And, and I think every, as we think through, you know, what is, you know, what, where, are the, where, where is the place for citizen voices and how do you have community discussion and engage audiences, that you think about that has to be within the context of strong, vetted journalism, that as we go forward in this new era that we still have those standards. I think um, public broadcasting has an advantage in, in the area of brand in that we have a well-established brand that's known um, in many places like here in Wisconsin for our local brand as well as the national public broadcasting brand. And it consistently shows up in surveys of, as one of the top most trusted institutions when where federal money goes or, or individual donations go. So the trick for us is carrying that brand into the new media, to the new audiences, and helping them recognize that the same ethics and integrity that has been in the established brand is being carried into this area where there is so much and people can find anything and they wonder, how can I trust this? Who is behind this? If we can carry that brand into new media, then it, it works pretty well for us. Um, some number of years ago when federal funding for public broadcasting was challenged, a number of general managers and corner office folks around the country realized they need to get stronger and stronger into uh, fundraising and, and other sources of money. And in some cases, that was at the expense of journalistic integrity. And, and the word was, well, uh, if we don't have money, we can't do our mission. We can't fulfill our mission. But in Wisconsin, and, and for me, and, and fortunately the people who are above me in the offices, um, it's, if you don't have a mission, then you're not going to get the money. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a couple things that have been said here. And there's one, one divide as we move into our models question. I'm going to uh, use the pathways question that John has suggested, and Kathy, actually all of you have suggested a few pathways. And one of the pathways for maintaining ethical journalism is a, is a, is a hybrid model, a series of hybrid models. So, Kathy partly represents a hybrid in that it's public, but it's, it's, it certainly is public, but it's also a mixture of public-private money. John uh, Ellens in, in the Academy, Phil is certainly the most traditional in terms of his media institution among us. But my question is, you both, there, there's two ways of thinking about this, and you've referenced both of them. One is to think about the old ethics being maintained, as it were, as we move into the new world. And the other is the question of whether the ethics itself has to change as we move into the new models of the new world. So I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts about whether that's the case. And that obviously speaks to the model question as well. If we're building bastions and moats that essentially are safe from the attack of the, of the, new, uh, the new media world, that is one set of issues. If we, we maintain our old traditions, but we, we do them on new media, or do we actually have to transform our traditions? 
One of the things I hear a lot in, in our newsroom, and I think probably is a conversation that goes on perhaps in others, probably in others, is the debate over, well, it's not, you know, when you're sorting out what, what do you do, what do you not do, how do you, how do you accomplish what you need to accomplish, how do you not, that there is this, uh, there has to be the separation. You have to analyze what it is you're fighting for uh, on certain things. Uh, could, uh, and the phrase that comes up again and again in, in our place is conventions versus convictions. That there are conventions, that we, there are things that, that we as, as newspapers have done for, and, and, and other media have done uh, over the years because that's the way it's come down, that's the way it's been done. And then there are, and, and, and we hold to those things, and then there are the things that uh, we do not just because they're the way that we've always done, they cut to a core value, a core belief, a, something that we do feel if you, if you cross that line you would, you would breach uh, some threshold that, that would be damaging. Um, a, a specific example, for example, uh, would be, be uh, ads on the front page. At this point, almost every <coughs> paper in America has had ads on the front page. At one point, this was unthinkable. This is something that was convention. Does it really alter? It, it may be garish. It may not be unattractive. It may not even be effective. But but and and, and obviously there are different different kinds of ads in different situations. And but but does that really in in a world where a web page, for example, has ads all over it, uh, does that really affect the 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 content around it any more than it would on any other page of a uh, of a publication? That's convention. Um, conviction would be you don't you don't take ad money from someone and then change the way you cover the the, the advertiser. That's conviction. Obviously, that's an obvious example. But but the 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 point is that that in in going through what we do and 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 why we do it, I think there's this analysis, especially as as newspapers get more aggressive in trying to to and all media outlets get more aggressive in trying to sustain themselves. Uh, economically, they're going to rethink just about everything that's out there and weigh what it is that they truly need to, ma you know, to maintain the brand, and everything else is is not as, uh, you know, the, I think I think there's a certain amount of introspection and analysis to say, well, what really is important, what really does matter, what is what is truly an ethical question, and what is really just a question so, of so tradition. As we move to these new models, then what is what do we keep as we move into the new models of the, the models of the new world, and what uh, uh, what changes? Yeah. Let me jump in here. I think we need to go pa back to the definition of what journalism is. Journalism is truth telling and community building. So, in my in my world, <laughs> I'm sure others of you have uh, additional uh, traits that you would add there. But in my book, truth telling, community building. So, if you take that as your core value. Uh, a lot of stuff falls away. Looking at my past uh, behavior, my past uh, achievements, um, when I was in the MSM, the mainstream media, I think we spent an awful lot, too much time talking about front page ads. Does that really affect truth telling and community building? On the other hand, I am really concerned as I now from the outside am looking in at how the medium of um, um, the, some of the online and some of the broadcasting um, behaviors are um, affecting this um, wonderful uh, democratic uh, democracy needed uh, craft that we call journalism. And I'd, you know, I'd love to hear about that. I mean, for me, ethics is a code of behavior that um, a group of people um, set uh, to give guidelines to people about how to act in a way to protect uh, what they care the most about. And if it's truth telling and community building, <coughs> there's, a, there's a lot of leeway there. And I think that we, um, particularly those of us elders in the room, need to be good coaches to the new journalists that are coming up. I think uh, one ethical standard that I think is really important to maintain in this period of transition is transparency and accountability. And the, and we've seen this again in, in, in our work in, in trying to collaborate with, and collaborating with a lot, dozens of, of media outlets, print and broadcast. It's, it's been interesting and instructive to, to see how different newspapers and other outlets have reacted over time 
to these projects where, where often we'll fund a, a freelancer. We might, we might spend five or ten or even you know, $20,000 or more on a project to send someone for several months to a region of the world, an underreported story, and then we work with the journalist to place that in as many outlets as possible. And it's amazing how many places have, have been interested, they've run the stories, and, and they, but they've not identified, I think they should identify where the funding is coming from. And, and increasingly, I think this That's is an issue as, the, as, as media outlets, because they don't have the resources themselves for this kind of work, they're turning to outside partnerships. But there's, it is sort of gets back to the old notion of, of competition and notions of exclusivity that, 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 that papers and other outlets will, they'll run a piece and, they'll, and it'll be presented as if it was entirely under the sponsorship of that newspaper or other outlet itself. And without mentioning the, the connection, in this case, to, to us, and it happens with, with other collaborators as well. And, you know, I think that that's a, on the one hand, it's a disservice to the reader. The reader should know. I mean, I, I, I think that the Pulitzer Center um, is, a, is a, a wonderful institution and, and that we have a very disinterested approach to journalism, but, but that's my opinion. People should, people should look at the paper or the other outlet and see where it's coming from. Um, and, the, and I think it's also, in, over time, it, 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 it actually strengthens the, the, the work because it, it, it lets people know that this is part of a, a, a broader, deeper, Project. So if it appears in a, a television outlet or in a radio or newspaper and you say, well, this is, this is funded by the Pulitzer Center for additional information on this project, uh, photography, video, blogs, et cetera, go to the Pulitzer Center site, and then people know that it's part of something bigger. And that's people are, it's, it's, it's heartening to see how fast that's changing. Uh, but it's been a, it's, it's a, it's a learned behavior because people like to think that they, they, they have total ownership of whatever appears in their outlet and that they, they, they give short shrift to the, to the, the, to the resources that go into making it possible. I, th I think we're in our infancy of, this, of these new models. We, uh, at the State Journal, we worked with, with Al on a Madison Commons um, project that we can talk about later, but um, uh, I think that um, the great uh, unwashed masses out there with whom I work now they have lots of ideas and they are publishing and they are opining and they are um, reporting. They are doing truth telling and community building and I don't think we've really uh, uh, clicked into that yet. We're all pretty traditional up here in terms of what um, is happening out there in the community, certainly what's happening at our community college. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about the transparency uh, issue you mentioned and, and an issue that has come up for us, and I'm just going to give an example and to, to, to muse upon. Uh, usually, in the past, we would not accept money from an organization that had a vested interest, potentially a biased interest in a topic if we were going to do documentaries. I'll, I'll, I'll say, for example, if we were going to do a documentary on uh, the food pantries in Madison, we wouldn't accept funding from a food pantry to help pay for that documentary. There's a model that has actually been um, started by Twin Cities Public Television. They, they do what's called the Minnesota Channel, and they have a number of broadcasts on that public broadcasting channel that are funded in part by the entity that is connected to the topic. So in this case, a food pantry could come to the station and say, we would like to do a documentary on homelessness and food pantries and things like that. We have this amount of money. Would you partner with us and help present this to the public? And Minnesota Public Television has a number of rules of whether or not they will accept that sort of partnership. One of them is, is the documentary inherently self-promotional to the entity that's providing some of the funding, or is it good, valuable public interest information. And if it is seen as good, valuable public interest information, they'll, among other, other uh, guidelines, they'll go into that partnership. Now, TPT always has the, the rights to pull the plug on it, to not broadcast it, whatever, mm -hmm. but in mo and they have done that, but in most cases these shows air, and they air with a notice at the front who's, where the funding is coming from, as all of our shows have that and trust that the public understands and can decide for themselves, does that funder therefore jeopardize what I believe in terms of the fairness of the content? That's a big 
change, and um, it's being debated. I, I just want to know, so, so two, two things here. First of all, we've just a quick summary. I am a professor. What can I say? Uh, uh, Phil, I think, made a useful broad distinction between conventions and convictions, which, leaves, which is a good way of broadly framing things, which leads, obviously, to the question of what our core convictions are. And some of the core convictions that have been suggested in the last few minutes are uh, truth-telling and community building, transparency and accountability, and the distinction between uh, a s inherently self-promotional interest and a valuable public interest. And of course, the question then becomes, and I, I would love to spend the rest of our time just on those core values, actually, but the, but the question that that then raises is, under what models are these core convictions going to be put into effect? And the models do affect the form of the convictions, and Kathy's comment just illustrated that beautifully. I mean. I've, I've been associated with public television for some years, and uh, uh, public television always needs money and always needs ways to do things. Uh, uh, I have to say that the reigning philosophy here has always been have a good idea, go do it, and then find money, for which I credit <laughs> James Steinbach in the back of the room. But yet, I, I think that's a good ethical approach. But nonetheless, we all know that to do good journalism, you need money. And so partnerships are one way that are emerging. But along with the partnerships, and, and they've been discussed briefly by everyone here, or referred to, comes another movement that I think poses an ethical challenge. And I want to use this as a platform for moving into our question about models before we turn to the, the broader uh, internet community joining us. And that is, are we facing a migration? And it goes back to this moat question I was raising before. Yes. The Pulitzer Center is an important center. The Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism here, at U partnership with UW and Wisconsin Public Television is a great place to do investigative journalism. Um, uh, we do journalism in our respective nonprofit institutions. Those are critical, they're important, but increasingly they're becoming the place where we do ethical, good, jur traditional journalism. And in some ways, does that relieve the uh, the traditional uh, media institutions um, from the either the burden of continuing those traditions, or is it essentially a necessary flight into the nonprofit arena? I don't, think, I, don't think you can, I don't think you can say that it's relieving them of an obligation that they're simply abandoning it. It's, it's happening. It's just a, it's just a fact. I mean, there's, in, in, in my field, the abandonment and, is a fact. Yeah, by the traditional means, somebody we, we, we're looking for new models because the old model is not meeting that need, and and I, I don't see any near-term prospect for the old traditional uh, mainline me mainstream media to to fill that gap with the corporate structure that, that they now have. I mean, it's an open question whether even the New York Times can, but we're seeing we're seeing what's happening at Phil's paper. I mean, the, they, essentially the Tribune is giving up foreign coverage. They're going to they're going towards a modular structure where they're going to, I think, essentially the idea is to farm it out to the LA Times and you'll have well, just a handful of people doing the, doing the work. And this is one of the great journalistic institutions in America. It's not, well, the, the, not, going, to have, it's not going to have an independent voice on foreign affairs. Yeah, well, I mean, what's happening, and I think this is one of the changes that you're going to see, is that you're talking about how when you do a story, you're trying to put it in as many places as possible. I think you're going to have, you know, as if, if the money's going to dry up, and, and, and I mean, journalism, it's still a profitable enterprise in an awful lot of places, but the margins are coming down, and that's that's kind of what you, you you're seeing some companies try to protect right now. Um, if if the money's going to dry up, then you have to decide exactly what you're going to do and focus on it and do it as well as you can. Which means I think with with and and, and uh, you know it's not as though I mean Tribune is contributing a little bit to the foreign, but but. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's it's shifted in terms of the company. The Tribune company is going to produce those the the, the foreign coverage for all the Tribune papers. Um, I think you're going to see more cooperation, and it's not just going to be within uh, within a single company. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, trying to figure out how can you share resources. What's really important? What is what is the things that if if if, if in an, uh, the media environment we're now in, where everything ends up on the internet and everything is available to everyone, what can you contribute that's unique to you, and and where's the you know how do you accomplish the other stuff? And I think in this case, um, yeah, there's there's been a, a sort of a realignment of uh, and reassessment of priorities, but for the things that that you can't invest in to the extent that you once did, I think you're going to see cooperation, and whether it's 
pairing with with uh, with partners, and I, I you know I what, what you're describing mm -hmm. does raise some red flags, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Uh, but but you're going to look for other ways to fund what it is you do and 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 cooperation, the sharing of resources among media outlets is is going to be one of those things. But and, we're we're uh, partnerships in even if you aren't going into an, a non-media entity, but partnerships among uh, various types of media. I was talking with the folks with Andy Hall and the folks from the uh, Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism the other day. We're we're just in the beginnings of this, so. The idea, and you'll hear more about it from Andy later, but if, if the center is going to help every media outlet in the state do something, investigate something, and, and, and if it's going to lead, in our case, to a, a broadcast documentary, something we can put on the air, well, how much of the resources, the videographer time, the editing time, and all that does Wisconsin Public Television put in versus what does the center have the funding for versus if, if the documentary is going to be distributed to every broadcaster in the state has the right to air a component of it, then should every broadcaster be contributing towards the videography resources or the re reporter resources or whatever? And even, you get down to nitpicky details, but they're critically important in surviving as a business and having a product that we can all vouch for and be proud of. Well, that's one of the things to think about in terms of these new models that I think is really important is maintaining diversity. And, and there's a tendency, as everybody's grappling with this enormous change that we're going through, to look for the simple, big solution. I mean, there, there was a, a lot of talk, I mean, many people here, I'm sure, have seen the discussion in the papers over the last couple of months. Well, there should be a $5 billion endowment that's going to endow the New York Times and sustain its $200 million a year news gathering budget. Uh, which would be a wonderful thing, except maybe that, that might perpetuate bad practices in the New York Times. I mean, if you put $5 billion and you put all of, that, all of those chips on one, one place, as good as the New York Times is, that makes no sense to me. I, mean, I, I think we need to figure out a, a model that, that distributes what funding there is in the nonprofit world to lots of entrepreneurial startups, some of which are going to be for profit, some of which are going to be not for profit, some of which are going to be based at university and some not. And there's a lot, you can already see it around the country today. I mean, you see it with the Andy Hall Center here, the work that Brand Houston's doing in Illinois, and I think our center, the Center for Investigative Reporting, there's a lot of great stuff that's going on where people are trying different approaches, ProPublica. And I, I, I just think it's important to figure out a way, and we've been talking about sort of models of funding, sort of a collaborative funding mechanism that, that would come up with some sort of objective criteria. If you look to the foundation world, to the corporate world, maybe even to the government, if this is structured right, and you say, well, we want to sustain, we have to figure out some way that's going to sustain journalism's role in a democracy, where you're going to have the kind of role that a lot of big regional papers and metropolitan papers traditionally have played that are disappearing from the scene. We're seeing them disappear, and the ones that are still there are hollowed out. So if you're thinking about how you're going to replace that, think about a funding mechanism that's going to distribute it to a lot of people who are doing good work and help to sustain them. Because the most important thing to all of us is trying to figure out where is our sustained support going to come from? Where is the core support? Not just applying to a foundation for a specific grant to do a specific project, because then you end up being beholden to the foundation or the individual, and you're sort of going after their agenda rather than functioning as journalist. I, it, yeah, I just want to jump in here because we're talking about how are we going to save the um, current mainstream media outlets. I'm not talking about that. When there <laughs> are uh, thousands and thousands of publishers out in our communities who are um, developing and giving us very rich journalism some of them are not. And so I think it, this actually comes down to a question of whether journalism is going to be a job or whether journalism is going to be a volunteer activity which is sponsored by foundations. If those of you in the audience aren't familiar with J-Labs at the University of Maryland, they've done a tremendous job at giving uh, community groups a uh, voice um, by helping them develop their technology so that they can publish more often primarily online and communicate with their communities. One of the biggest debates that uh, editors have when they get together, editors of mainstream media, is are these people doing journalism or are they opining about a, um, about a very specific issue? And um, I, I have to tell you my feelings have changed on that since I've left the newsroom. And I see, I think we're either going to go to a model where there are 
thousands of voices in the marketplace of ideas versus 2,000 voices uh, in the marketplace of ideas. And that is a, not just a uh, industry shift, it's a radical cultural shift that, um, that our um, great leaders in this room are, are uh, leading the charge on how we set guidelines for that kind of communication. I want to, I want to jump in and add to, to Ellen's uh, job or volunteerism or volunteer slot, the other, the other great uh, possibility, which is vocation. And in fact, uh, that's what we've trained people to do in the great journalism schools, and that's what we may be seeing, certainly the transformation of, if not the decline of. Um, I also want to pick up on a uh, colloquy between John and Ellen a minute ago. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't think anybody here is talking about preserving things as they are, only whether we ought to or we ought not to, we probably can't. I think we all agree on that. Things are changing rapidly. Um, but I think that something that Phil said a few minutes ago, um, we're actually seeing a, a logic of what we might call specialization, or in social science speak, we'd call it differentiation, where actually we're seeing the unbundling of all of the old media functions. Now, at one level, that's obvious. The old mass media institutions are coming apart, but what we're seeing are strands of those now being taken up by special institutions like the Pulitzer Center, like the Center for Investigative Reporting, like Wisconsin Public Television in some sense, its role becomes transformed. And in some sense, even the mainstream media's roles become transformed, as Phil said, because they now have to choose to specialize in what they do best. And as we see that large-scale unbundling, we're also going to see a whole panoply of ethical issues um, being raised. Katie, do we have a question at this time, or, or is the online world still getting up? <laughs> we do? We do. Okay, could you pose it? Okay. Get the microphone we need a mic, though. Okay, so one of the questions, we have a number of questions, but one of them posed was, you've talked a lot about extending a brand online. What do you recommend for smaller news organizations that don't have a dominant brand? Can we survive online? Yes, but you got to get there fast. I hate all this talk about brand. <laughs> it, it just makes me crazy. I, I, know, I know that's important, and believe me, at the community college, we, we talk about it uh, almost hourly. But um, it's, uh, for the smaller news organizations, brand is uh, an important way to think about it, but it's also reaching audience where they are and giving audience the kind of information that they want when they want it. I mean, that's the big shift. We, when I started in this business 30 years ago, we were the center of the universe. We smart editors, we gave information to people who were less smart than we. Now we have figured out that the user slash reader is in the center of the universe. And they are sharing uh, wisdom with us just as robustly as we are sharing it with them. So I think uh, a smaller news organization has to get there as fast as they can. And partnering with your community college, which has lots of people who, uh, <laughs> who uh, know, know, how, know how to so put up shame, websites, well, shameless, uh, is a good idea. Shameless yeah. plugs are part yes, of the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, I think a smaller, I think a small, in deference to your uh, dislike of brand, identity, presence, uh, I think a smaller news organization actually has a, a, an opportunity in this environment because there's a leveling of the playing field when you're out in the in the digital world. The the uh, you know the traditional model was that when you owned a city, when you had a newspaper in a city or a publication or a news a TV station or radio station in a city, you were in that market and and, th and there were barriers to entry through because it was very expensive to start a press and put up a antenna. You can show up at your public library, get into wireless access, and put something online. Um, what will what will in the end put your material out there and get you your audience is the relevance of the material, the way you speak to the community, the truth that you tell, and the and the and the way you convey it. Um, and then your readers, your, you know, the audience will then, if if the material is good become evangelists for you and spread it to their friends and and you are in this playing field with the brand the big brands the big boys 
as John and Kathy, as you think of an answer to that question, I just want to twist the question a little bit back to the, not how do we brand or should we brand. I think for survival, we know that those things are important, but what does branding have to do with the new ethical universe and particularly with new ethical models, or does it? If I can throw that question out to you all on the fly. <laughs> Because well, I think it's, it's obvious that, that, that people need to brand in a, in a fragmented media universe and how we do that we could discuss in a marketing seminar and it's an important question, I'm not dismissing it, but in fact what John said a few minutes ago suggests that there's a lot more pressure to brand because this differentiation means that you need an identity out there. Does that pose new ethical challenges? Well, I think it's it, it, partly you have, to, you have to decide what it is you're doing, and that can that can be a small community-based organization, or it can be a large national thing, which which goes after a niche, whether it's investigative reporting or international reporting, um, as in our case. And then I think Ellen's point is really really important about finding going to the audience where they are, finding them, and and in in our in our work. I mean, we started off with the idea we were simply were sort of filling the gaps on the supply side. And we were, I was acutely conscious, having covered a lot of the run-up to the Iraq war, that not, I didn't think there were enough voices, enough journalistic voices out in the world telling us about things that could really hurt us in terms of American foreign policy. There wasn't enough debate about that. So, so that was one of the cases I made in raising money to start the Pulitzer Centers. We needed to have more of that, and we'd find places to put it. And I think, you know, we've done very well at filling that gap. But then as we got into this, we were uh, discovered that, that the much bigger crisis, in a way, in journalism is on the demand side. It's the audience that we've lost. It's, it's the fact that most people at this university uh, are not reading a newspaper. They're not engaged with traditional media whatsoever. That's gone. It's just, not, it's just not happening for anybody under 40. And so you have to figure out, as you're doing this work, how do you take it out to where the people are? And so we started doing a lot of aftermarketing and, and these projects, the best of our projects, we, we set up a global gateway which, which takes the, the work out into high schools and universities. We take the journalist out and we've created these interactive web portals and it's PulitzerGateway.org. I think we're not, we're, we're under instructions not to do show and tell today so I won't, so I won't show you but do look at it. If you, if you look on, on site, look at it because they are quite remarkable on issues such as women and children in crisis, the food issues around the world, internal conflicts in India and water issues where we've got multiple reports. Each one of those is half a dozen or more separate projects that we funded uh, around the world. And we put them together in, in interactive portals with study guides, teacher lesson plans, opportunities to ask the journalists questions, the journalists respond to those questions. Uh, and then this, you have a dialogue, so you have the opportunity, there's something called Your Stories on the site where you can put up your own videos using a YouTube platform and Google Maps. and if you look at the, one of these that, that on the list here somewhere is on Water Wars, there, there, you'll see that there are 150 different videos that have been produced from experts and individual citizens all around the world that on, on water issues and how it's affecting. So, but it's within the context of good quality journalism that's been on NPR, on major newspapers, on public television. So you're, you're trying to have a discussion, give people an opportunity to engage in the discussion within the framework of serious journalism. And in and, and, and so doing, by going out to high schools and universities, we create the market for our material. And we hope we're creating a market for journalism in, ger in general, that people will become accustomed to looking for this kind of, kind of information. And on the university side, we've started a, what we call a campus consortium where because we've done a hundred plus events on campuses where we've taken our journalists to campus uh, we've gone to we've appealed to universities to partner with us on an ongoing official basis we said join the campus consortium give us ten thousand dollars a year we'll bring at least two of our projects and journalists on campus we'll have a student liaison at your campus and we'll set aside two thousand of that ten thousand uh, to have a, a funded travel fellowship that students at your school can compete for. And so that's a way of marketing the journalism, it's a way of getting exposure for the journalist, it's a way of getting income for the journalist, because that $10,000 covers the cost of bringing the journalist and paying them an honorarium. And we've got seven universities from Oregon to University, Ohio University, Washington University, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, have committed $10,000 each to be part of this, and we think there's potential for that growing. And that's a, that's a model where we partner with universities. 
How about community we, colleges? We'd love for community colleges. We're, we're trying to do one. I'll give you my card. We'd love to do that. So, 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 <laughs> right. But it's a, and I'll it's, find the 10,000 bucks. And we, you know, we say that this would be universities that, you know, every university has a, a, has a speaking, speaker's budget. And, and we think that, you know, in, my, in my humble opinion, a lot of that is wasted on big name people who cost 50 or $80,000. And not I this think, conference. not this conference, <laughs> but if, not this conference. But if you bring in, particularly these, these younger journalists who are doing wonderful work, and who you know, some of these uh, journalists we're working with are in their late twenties, early thirties, and the spectacular work and success at actually placing it in national outlets and beginning to get an income and a foothold on a career, that is very inspiring. And I've seen it dozens of times. And we present these projects. We put them in front of a room of journalism students. They say, I could do that. I could be that person 10 years from now. And it's, it's engaging the universities, the community colleges, high schools in this whole effort to make all of us better informed and better engaged. So. Phil, you want to Well, I was just going to say, going back to your original que to the question, which is, you know, all this talk of brand is a marketing term. As this pertains to ethics, it's reputation. Mm -hmm. It's expectation. It's the knowledge that if you go to a certain entity, whatever you want to call it, that is reliable and ethical and transparent and, and going to give you a quality product, a quality, quality information. And that's where it matters. That's where it comes back. And that's how it, it, it manifests itself. And that's where the, the, the conversations intersect. Well, I want to open up questions to the audience now. But I, as we're doing that, um, I want to. Um, just to underscore one thing, a thread that just came through here, which is that branding in the new media universe isn't the same as branding in the old, that it actually involves an ethics of openness, of participation, of transparency, and that in fact, for even for small media outlets, that may be the direction that they need to go, and collaboration as well. So we may have a different ethics, in fact, evolving in the new media universe as we try to weave these different strands together. Uh, in the in the back, Phil. The woman in the in the aqua. Yes. The woman right, right in the there, aqua right jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Phil. Yes. Right. Yes. So close, you can't see. Could you identify Charlotte yourself McDaniel. too, please? Thank you. Charlotte McDaniel. In the essence of uh, transparency, I will identify my field as ethics, not journalism. So uh, my question will be obvious. I um, I'm intrigued by the concepts that have been emerging this morning. And as I'm sitting there thinking about it, I go back to Mr. Rosenthal's first comment. Uh, if I'm going to read a newspaper or so watch something online, I want to know that it's ethical. Then I assume it has some standards. If it doesn't, I can't figure out why in the world anybody would want to read it or look at it, because we could assume it's dishonest, if nothing else. So it brings me to my primary question, which is these two concepts of old ethics, new ethics. And of course, with my hat on as someone who does work in ethics, when did we lose old ethics? Are we saying that honesty is no longer relevant, accountability is no longer relevant, and I can go down the list, but what are we substituting it with? I mean, what is new ethics? And I'd really like to hear some conversation on that, particularly in terms of concepts. Yeah, I well, it is, it is easy for me in that maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I don't think ethics have changed. Lou, when you were just listing what you considered the new, the new realm, the collaboration, transparency, uh -huh. and all these things in the new media, I think that's exactly what successful old media needs to be doing as well in our old mediums. Um, so can I, I ask you, Kathy, have, yeah. have, we, always do, have we been doing oh, that? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> no, but that is then a shift. Because yeah. if those are ethical standards, right. and I think we can probably, I think we can agree that they are, mm -hmm. Well, there are certainly standards, whether they're ethical or not, we right. can debate for a while. Um, but we can certainly agree that the old media have not necessarily operated according to collaborative ethic or right. full transparency at all times, and that the new media at their most demanding, not always in practice, either do. But there is a shift there. There's a shift in that sense. But I do still believe that successful, ultimately successful media, old or new, will have those standard huh. ethics. The change is, if as a consumer you are betrayed by the provider of information, you now have a million other places you can go. It used to be, you know, you lived in La Crosse, Wisconsin. If you didn't like the La Crosse Tribune, well, too bad. If you want some information, that's the only place you're going to get 
lacrosse information. <laughs> now you can get lacrosse information from individuals and bloggers and online, all that sort of stuff. So it's easier to abandon and it's easier as a media provider to screw up. You screw up once in the old world, you could be forgiven. You screw up now, people just abandon you. And that raises the bar, I think. Well, I think there's, mm. a, there's, another, there's another aspect. I think, I think there's a great temptation. One, one of the things that's different in the new environment that is tempting people to perhaps unethical behaviors, and it gets back to sort of marketing and building a brand and how do you establish an audience. There's a reason that the Drudge Report has been very successful, or that you know some of the, the people who are on Politico or on Huffington, they are purposely trying to write you know, with an extreme edge, and and the the blogosphere rewards that. They they and, and you know we're we're about sort of unreport underreported stories on complicated topics, and we're trying to show people that, that that these issues are difficult. They need to engage with it, and and we and we and the reporting the standard is very very high. But it's hard to sell that because it's not. It'd be easier to if we put if we put a headline that said that that President Obama has totally screwed up the way something's happened. I mean, you know, we sort of went after. Sort of, if we took a strong position, it would be much easier to build to be picked up on the blogs and to sort of build an audience. And and so you have to sort of figure out the, one of the challenges: how do you maintain those standards? I don't think the standards have changed at all. I think that that, that they're absolutely right what's been said. Uh, but the question is: how do you maintain that in this new wide open? Web world. I, I do think the standards have changed, and um, I just think we're not living in that world. We're living in a different world. My daughter is a blogger uh -huh. um, who writes on Islam uh, as part of a project at the University of Wisconsin, and um, she has a whole different view of standards and ethics and and uh, telling the truth. Um, and we we spend a lot of time arguing about this at our household. But the um, the question I think could be posed in the terms of um, what is, uh, has, has truth changed? Um, I mean, this, we think of this as a constant value, um, but is it constant? Um, uh, a lot of younger uh, media consumers that I talk to, they want many, many voices, and they want to decide amongst those voices what are the truths. In the journalism business, the mainstream media, we let people opine, but they must opine on established fact, not on something that they heard on the street or read in Wikipedia, but something that they have established as uh, credible, uh, verifiable information. I think that's a difference between these two worlds, and I think that there's some uh, very interesting research paper there that uh, I'm not smart enough to write. Well, it's, it's, I think, I think right. ethics, ethics, you're coming at it from a classical standpoint. Ethics are ethics. That doesn't change. Uh, core values do not change. Application of them uh, and how they fit in context, that may change. You know, part of it is that, as I said before, I, and, and this, is, uh, this is sort of a description of how journalism has changed, you used to own a market because of your location. Now, the only way you really own news is by, uh, through two methods. One, you either get there first and stake your claim to something that everyone's going to get a hold of at some point, or you go off in a direction no one else is going in and you cover that territory. Uh, and and, and you, you get, again, you get there first, but something you own and something you control. Uh, the, one of the differences that, that you see in, in journalism today, one, a lot of people are going out with information, and, and this is a subject that will come up in a panel later, in which uh, be competitive pressures are putting things out there and, and changing, uh, you know, forcing people to confront questions that maybe they would have had to confront once a day in, a, in, a, in an old situation, now confronting it every few minutes. You know, do we go with this? Do we not go with this? Is this confirmed? Is this close enough? You know, it, it, what do we know and how much of it uh, do we, and how much can we tell at this point and be certain of? That these, and, and these are things that reflect back on our reputations and, and, and what we do. Um, I don't know that the truth has changed as much as our ability to, to be certain of what we know is, 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 is always being tested. And it's being held accountable by our readers and our consumers, which is, which is good. But, uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, people will turn on you and abandon you in a second, it's partly because 
there, that you can create greater awareness of a mistake, of a gaffe. The other thing that's changing in, 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 in the media environment that goes beyond journalism but affects journalism is that entities themselves can put out not journalism necessarily, but journalism like information into the same trough, and people will pick it out. And, and what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of cases, uh, and this goes beyond newspapers, this is television, this is everything, but is that, you know, truth is, is I don't think truth is a relative term, but our ability to perceive it can be. Uh, people that watch certain television news networks have a sense of what is right, what is correct, what is fair, accurate, and balanced. And, and then there are people who watch other channels and have a feeling that what is on the first channel is complete nonsense. And, and so in empowering, in empowering the consumer, there's a, there's a question over, well, what is truly right, you know, correct and truthful information and what isn't? Um, there's this sorting out of information that says, um, this is the truth I choose to believe. I, I want to move on to some yeah. other. Uh, that's a, those are actually critical points and towards the back, Phil. But, and while we're going there, I want to point out the difference between truth, which is something we could, have, of course, also spend a few minutes on, <laughs> standards of verification, again, another important question, but also forms of verification, and not just for journalists, but forms of verification for our readers. Increasingly, our readers do not rely on us as the source of, as the sole source of verification. Verification is something that is widely distributed, and people will read broadly before they accept what we say is true. And that's, I think, a major shift. Yeah. My name's Harvey Black. I'm a freelance science writer in Madison. Uh, picking up on Alan's term of truth-telling and the earlier discussion about uh, uh, ethics, uh, the question I have is essentially this. What kind of sanctions get imposed with respect to ethical violations. And I'll give you uh, a kind of example. Several years ago, George Will wrote a column uh, dealing with global warming uh, in which he argued that 20 or 30 years ago, scientists were talking about global cooling. In the course of that column, he used a quotation from a National Academy of Sciences report, which was so selective that it can only be explained, his use of it can only be explained by deliberate misrepresentation and intellectual dishonesty. Now, what kind of, George Will is still writing, to my knowledge he hasn't been slapped on the wrist or anything like that, so what kind of sanctions get imposed or can get imposed or should get imposed when someone, even a columnist, violates what uh, I would consider to be, and, and other people would consider to be, uh, some sort of ethical standard in terms of truth-telling. Okay, so I want to focus on two t sanctions in two dimensions. One is in uh, an old, a traditional media system where someone is employed, and the other is in a new media system where uh, the only real correction is a countervailing voice. I think the, the sanction is, is there to be seen on the, on the Internet. I mean, if you go to, this is for one of the values of the web. If you, if you, if you Google George Will and, and global warming, you will come up with hundreds of entries of people debating just the, the points you just made, people attacking George Will. It's now out there. It'll be there forevermore. I mean, George Will has a defense of that. I, I think, as I recall, the Washington Post also ended up defending the letting that phrase stay in, stay in that piece. But, but I want to go, in a way it goes back to Alan's point, I want to speak up for Alan's daughter and the, and the, the value of multiple voices and, 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 and don't, trying to get... Don't anybody try, tell her that that's trying to, to Trying to get it truth and, I, and, and challenge a bit the idea that, that, that we really did have a standard in the, in the traditional mainstream media that, that if you were going to opine it had to be within certain accepted facts. Because if you look back, I mean, why wouldn't you be skeptical as a member of, of, of your daughter's generation having lived through the last 10 years when it was accepted as fact throughout the, the traditional media, you know, with very few exceptions, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, that, that deregulation of the banks was a great thing, and that we were, you know, the economy was on solid footing. This was, you know, it, 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 you, you're hard pressed to find much in the way of analysis or challenge of that in the mainstream media over the period of years leading up to both of these rather catastrophic results in foreign policy and in financial policy. So it goes back, I mean, I think, I think it's really, really important to try to do whatever we can to encourage a multitude of voices so that the truth does emerge out of that. In the case of George Will, 
It's, it's people, it's a, it's a debate that sets off a debate. And, and, and there are many, many people who will never read George Will quite the same way because they'll think that he manipulated the facts there. Others will come to a different conclusion, but it's out there as part of the record. Up front, okay. Phil. Thank you. Hello, I'm Patty Gellenberg. Ellen talked about the 100,000 voices of journalists out there or quasi-journalists and, you know, 99,000 of them I don't want to hear because, I, you know, I don't trust them. I'd like, however, aggregators whom I do trust to find the thousand and I'd like those thousand to be able to make a living. I don't want folks who are in their spare time being journalists. I want someone who's really doing this as a living, who has his reputation on the line, who thinks, like I'm sure many of us did, that the only, the only thing we have to sell is our credibility. All right? Are I you willing like, to pay for it? I want, here's what I think we could be valuable, yes. I am willing to pay for it. I know you it. are, Patty, but, but that, that's the problem. So <laughs> Many there's, the, exactly, Ellen, here's what the question is, and I think that we could be really helpful if we figure out how aggregators can make money with ethical journalism. Most of the big aggregators are corporations that might as well sell shoes, but instead they're selling news. If you can tell, Vi Viacom doesn't necessarily, well, I shouldn't say Viacom. Uh, let's just use a big corporation, uh, of which I would say a lot of newspaper and, and um, television, radio conglomerates are. They just want to make money. And if they think they can't make money with ethical journalism, they go to advocacy or entertainment journalism. I think our job is to help them make money with ethical journalism. So that's a comment rather than a question. Does anybody want to comment on the comment? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, the, what you're talking about is objectivity versus subjectivity. But I mean, objectivity came into, into fashion in part because uh, it was the opportunity to sell to more than one group. You know, you could sell to the major market. Part of what's happening in journalism, and this goes back to what I was saying about deciding what you do and do it well, uh, you know, the, 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 look at what's happened to department stores. Department stores used to be where you went to get a lot of everything. And boutiques are sort of where, uh, where retail is going, okay? Uh, even department stores now have little boutiques within themselves. And I think that's sort of what's happened with journalism. And, and, and so some of this uh, advocacy, non-advocacy, uh, non opinion, non-opinion, some of that is just deciding, you know something, we're going to specialize with this, we're going to carve out a part of the market with that, and that's how we're going to make money. You know, whether it's a nonprofit or a profit model, there still has to be a certain level of, of revenue to sustain it. And part of the problem that you have with, with when you talk about an aggregation model where you, you know, some money goes somewhere and it gets split up among the people that provide the content is, you know, information is, is a very fluid thing. It only takes one person who pays for it, takes the information out, summarizes it, and puts it somewhere where it doesn't cost any money, or someone else collects the, the check, and, and the money goes away. So, so I'm not sure it's as simple as, as what you're saying. Um, I I, I, no, it's not at all simple, but I mean, part of it is that the marketplace, you know, the, the reason big, what I, what I would suggest is that big corporations don't have to be the driving force. I mean, Drudge is not a big corporation, and he's about as successful an aggregator as there is out there. Huffington Post, too. Yeah, but I don't count them as the ones I look to for ethical journalism. How do we get the ethical journalism well, to make money? But I would point out, for example, that the McClatchy chain, formerly Knight Ritter and not coincidentally, I would say, uh, is one of the large corporations that is actively striving to maintain probably what most of us in this room would call ethical standards. So I'm not sure that that, that dichotomy is a useful way of framing things, but it's also not entirely true. It takes money to provide ethical journalism. There are some co corporations that are actually still trying to do that even in the new universe. I want to say, can, I, can, I, can I just say something quickly in defense of, of the biggest aggregator of all, of course, is Google. And, and Google is, has been responsible for a lot of bad trends in terms of taking the content for free. And, 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 hmm? But you're an aggregator. Well, we're, we're a content creator. We're not, no, we're not an aggregator. Everything, everything that's on our site, we have funded. We've created. 
And so we're a producer of content. We'd like to be aggregated by other people. So we're looking for, <laughs> we're look, we're looking, we're looking for platforms. But, but the, and this gets back to YouTube. The, I mean, you, Google acquired YouTube a couple of years ago. YouTube is you know, four years old, as you know, the biggest platform for video. They came to us last year to partner with them on the first reporting, video reporting contest that they've done. And it was a big success, and, and, we, and we used our public television reports from around the world, three of them, to frame the, 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 the assignments, the, the three rounds of this reporting contest. And, and YouTube did something which they never do. They, 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 there are ten finalists, including there were like four of them who were J School students. Uh, they put those videos on their home page for three days in December, and we got three million hits. Um, a lot of visibility, because YouTube chose for once to edit, exercise editorial control to try, because they're, and, and they're thinking through, and Google now as their parent is spending a lot of time, a lot of energy and money thinking about, well, they, they've got to play some role in content creation and, and help to fund that, because if they're just going to rely on, on traditional news media, which are cutting back more and more the provision of that content, where the hell is the content going to come from? So they are thinking about it, and, we, and nobody's, nobody's found it yet, but it's encouraging to us that they've been open to that discussion. What, what, I, what I would want suggest... I get several more okay. questions in here. Uh, you can aggregate yourself with your friends, though. That's the only other thing I, I would say. I'll never find myself. Well, you've got, got like-minded <laughs> people. You might not find yourself, create a you group can't find your friends. And Twitter to each other what you find and recommend to each other. No, I'm serious. If you find one story and you put it in the stream and other people send each send one story, you have a pretty good sense of what's out there from various communities and various people. Okay. Hi, uh, it's Owen Ullman from USA Today. I just wanted to give a response to your question about sanctioning, you know, old media for mistakes. And unfortunately, Ellen, I'm going to have to side with your daughter in this example. But at least you have a kid who reads, so I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by that. Uh, a few years ago, you may recall, it took a new medium to expose that a story by an iconic old medium, CBS and an iconic newscaster, uh, Dan Rather, reported uh, about George Bush's time in the National Guard using a forged document. And the verification was done by, I forget the name of the organization, but it was very carefully verified to show it was a fraud. And we know that Dan Rather is now out of his job as the anchor at CBS. So there's a case where you had you know, a new medium that did a lot of very good old-fashioned journalism, as all of you have talked about, and there was a big price paid by Dan Rather. In the case of uh, George Will, I would say his selective um, misrepresentation of facts maybe is less about journalism than another very high-paid profession, which I would call being a lawyer. So, um, you know, I don't know that that has to be sanctioned. That's part of our long system of uh, debate. Hi, uh, Katie, do we have one more question from the online participants? I like a talk show. I'm so he's our Phil Donahue. Sorry, I'm going back up to it. Okay, um, even as a journalism student, I'm still skeptical of the current media system. What do you think can be done to give young people like me a new faith in the media ethics and a desire to reach out and find information? It's a great question. I think we have to connect with them as providers as well. You were talking about working with students. Um, I think that's, that's one way. We can't just sit back in our offices and have meetings that drives my, my goddaughter who's 22 can't believe how many meetings people my age have and um, she, uh, you could just text each other <laughs> yeah. a lot quicker. So much simpler. <laughs> One of the projects that, that we did this past election cycle, uh, Wisconsin Public Television has a website called Wisconsin Vote. And one of the things we did with the Wisconsin Vote website was we um, made a version of it that could be uh, personalized isn't the right word, but we worked with the UW colleges around Wisconsin and a group of students at each college could take a portion of the Wisconsin Vote homepage and make it completely and specifically relevant to that campus, to that, that town. And so in trying to connect and have some of these uh, new emerging journalists and people seeking information 
connect with what I think is an, a, a nicely established and valuable brand of all journalism going into new media. I think blending all of these things is one way to help, but it's, it's bit by bit and, and little by little, without a doubt. We, we tell these journalism students that they own the future, that they, that they can create the, the world they're going to be working in, and that and they, they, if they go at this in an entrepreneurial way, it's amazing what they can accomplish. I mean, one of, one of our a journalists who's under 30 that we work with is Michael Cavanaugh, who we sent to Eastern Congo three times in the last year for a month each. And he's a radio reporter, had done freelance radio for the last four or five years, had never really done much print reporting, no television reporting. So we put him together with other outlets, and, and he wrote for Slate, and then we, we introduced him to people at World Focus, which is a new uh, Monday through Friday, half-hour international television, international news program, WNET, Channel 13 in New York, that goes, I think it's here, it goes out around the country. And so that's a show that started last September, October. We put Michael in touch with them. They ended up working with him, and they put together a, a, a really good piece on rape as a weapon of war. And which just won the, the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Prize for Best International Reporting on Television and Human Rights. And that's a, that's a competition that, that the networks and the cable channel, everybody competes for that. And here was a show that didn't exist a year ago, a reporter who had never done video television reporting before, uh, and with an organization, ours, that, that hadn't existed three years ago as a not-for-profit not 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 entity. And yet, it's, it's, it's uh, done this great work. And Michael's going to go on and do lots of other great work. And, and, and this is, I get back to saying why it's important to present these types of exemplars on, on college campuses and at journalism schools, because it can be done. It's not easy. I mean, Michael, I'm not saying that Michael's making a lot of money now, but Michael is on the way to having a significant career. And I think there are lots of other careers like that that are in the offings for people who are you know, eager and entrepreneurial enough to go out and seize their opportunities. I, I underscore uh, what John said. Um, I, um, uh, I don't want this time to end without us um, honoring Jim Burgess, who uh, funded um, this, uh, whole, started the funding for all of this discussion of ethics at the University of Wisconsin. Jim is um, a fellow capitalist and a former publisher <laughs> of the Wisconsin State Journal and a friend of mine. So. Um, I think that this kind of outreach that in actually involves younger people um, is extremely important in developing a welcoming attitude towards them. I think there's a generational divide that is hard to get over that is being played out in my own household. And I try very hard to, um, to leave my judgments and my um, insecurities about the fact that I can't keep up with this new media and uh, that it feels very threatening to the values that I have. But to, to open that door and to open your heart to the younger journalists, it's just, it's a nuanced and a, a rather subtle um, act, but it's uh, essential, I think. And, and thanks to Jim for bringing us together today. Phil, do you want to Well, I would just say, you know, the, the, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the cliche is the children are our future. Um, <laughs> the, the, well, in this, journalism case, in this is, case, the children may be our present. That's well, what they keep yeah. trying to tell Journal, us. Journalism <laughs> is, uh, it, it is something I've done for a living. It is, it is a career, but it is also a lifestyle. And the people that are drawn to it are drawn to it because it's, it's what they feel they must do. It is what gives them the greatest amount of fulfillment. Um, I think ethics are part and parcel to it, so I think that it's very difficult to separate out. And, and, and if there are market uh, driven pressures that, that threaten what we would embrace as a core value and pre then, then it makes it all the more important that, that peop the people who really believe in ethics uh, come forward and, and work in, in, in that framework. So I think there's a future for it because there's inherent value in what we do in what and the way we do it. And, and, and uh, the challenge for us is to find out how best to use uh, new technology and, 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 and work in this new environment. Uh, the optimism comes from the fact that we are, by nature, we are creative people. We produce something new every few seconds. And, and from those ideas, I think will come, you know, whatever the solution is to enable this to continue. But because there's a need for this, I think it's going to continue. I don't know how. 
Um, my optimism may be utterly misguided, but I just believe it's too important to go away completely. So that I, I can't think of it. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ken. Well, I, well, I just have to way. add <laughs> uh, one little note, because these guys are mentioning children. I came very late to motherhood. I have an eight-year-old, and she said something to me at home that you made me think of just this morning. My eight-year-old has a tendency to ask me questions that make my palms sweat. I can't answer them. She, it, it, she makes me nervous that way. And she did it this morning. I'm, she got up out of bed. I'm working on the computer. She comes in, and she stares at me for a bit, and then she says, Mom, why is it so easy to sin? <laughs> and I thought, I, I'm not sure I heard her correctly, so I asked her, and she repeated that, and I said, I would have said, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's really hard when you're in the middle of doing something to remember to do the right thing. It's, it's easy to do the wrong thing, and it's hard to stop and think and remember to do the right thing. Why is that? I said, well, I don't know, but I'm going to see a lot of smart people today, and maybe they'll tell me. So. I can't think of a better way to end this panel. I want to thank all of you, all of these great journalists who, who do embody the idea of journalism as a vocation for getting us off to a great start this morning. Thank you.